welcome to the Kryptonaut Podcast. My name is Mark Storrs, and I am joined by Mr. Robert Thomas Morphy II. That is goddamn right. We are enacting Thunderdome protocols, my friend. I will be your humongous. I will bring you through this wasteland to find gasoline, possibly oh. ice cream. There could be ice cream involved. I'm not taking it out of the uh, the measure yet. I love that. But in short, really, all you're saying, what you're truly conveying is we're Chris Free tonight. We are Chris Free and 23 at the moment. So, <laughs> so. <laughs> we're a year early. <laughs> Fear not, Christopher will return. But yes, Robert and I are taking on this uh, this two man show here, the Kryptonaut Podcast. Thank you all so very much for joining us. We have some shout outs, Robert, because Patreon is the thing that we offer and people like to monetarily support us monthly. It's unfathomable, but God bless him for it. Yes. And to begin with, and I'm just going to do this straight phonetically. To do it. Oxty three ad fac three. Uh, I, I think. You know, I mean, I don't even know if we can offer a correction on that because I don't even know what you're going for. So yeah, no, if thank I mean, you I know sometimes support. the actual number in words, you do it phonetically. That didn't seem to help. No, All right, I'm going to give it this other thing. I'll just do it the other way. Okay. OXD3 ADFAC3. Uh, coming at you. Coming at you. <laughs> psycho- Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. <laughs> psycho Pig and the Contra Beaver. Coming oh, at you. <laughs> Moving on to Soul Shot. Oh, shit. What up, Soul Shot? Andy. What up, Andy? Thank you. Suck it down, pipe. Yeah. Hell yeah. Suck it down. What up? Zaphod Beeblebrox, fellow uh, Hitchhikers re- fan. Returning, well I believe. Thank you. Yeah, I believe so too. Andrea Cerami. Hell yeah, Andrea. Thank you so much. Amanda Wharton. What up, Amanda? That is a noble name. Totally. John May. John, thank you so much. Karen JB. What up, Karen JB? Andrew Merriman. Andrew, thank you. Good sir. Austin Thompson. Oh, Austin, we love it. Thank you so much. Round the shit out. Yes, we do. I didn't mean to cut off your thank you, Austin. With Sam Petresky. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you to everyone that supports us over there. Patreon.com slash Kryptonaut Podcast. We appreciate it. We've done... Uh, uh, we officially last week was our hundred episode. So that's crazy. It yeah. was pretty cool. Yeah, no, it, it was dope. And we appreciate all the, all the monetary support over there. It helps keep the show afloat and keep some of us gainfully employed. And, uh, you know, I'm able to, uh, you know, pay bills and do all kinds of fun shit that adults have to do while talking with my friends about monsters. So there you go. I appreciate it. Rob appreciates like it. We perfect all life. appreciate Oh, fuck. It. Yes, yes, we do. Totally. For sure. As for I, you sure. know, cause we're remote as I look across to my sea of books, so much about the paranormal. I'm like, thank you guys. Yes. That helps exactly. so much. Cause I mean, I would definitely, it doesn't look like it, but I would trade food for books. Though yeah. I certainly don't <laughs> want for food. And well, uh, my, my, thanks uh, to you my, guys. I don't have to. My last NYSEG bill was like 350 bucks. So I appreciate y'all supporting me so I can pay my NYSEG bill. <laughs> so fucking A. Thank you. <laughs> yes. NYSEG kills me. Oh, she was speaking of things that will kill you, Robert. This week we are talking about Sky Beasts Ahoy! Atmospheric Monsters Attack. The one, the only, except that we've actually dealt with these before. And that's what makes it so cool. What we're doing is um, a general overview. Uh, based loosely on an article I wrote years and years ago, I don't even know when, of the the whole Sky Beast phenomenon. Obviously, we go back, we got gargantuan gliders, we got the uh, the Hampton Sky Rays, we've got uh, the Crawfordsville Monster. Like, we've dealt with some weird flying shit. But here, um, we're just going to try to encapsulate the the main theory theories, mostly by uh, Trevor James Constable, or James Trevor Constable, I don't know what, and just and just put it out there and have a good time with it, um, and 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 you know, and and just try to muddle through in a chrysalis week as we do. There you go. Let's get started with atmospheric monsters are bizarre and seemingly impossible creatures. These skybound beasts soar silently above the human race, seeming to defy the conventional laws of physics. And their origins and intentions remain one of the most perplexing and fascinating mysteries in the realms of both ufology and cryptozoology. Oh, so we're doing a little bit of the old crossing the streams here with some atmospheric monster beasts. I like it. 
you have to. You absolutely have to. Because, I mean, the fact that they are designated as beasts implies cryptozoology on known animals. But at the same time, they are flying. They are mishappen, misshapen. You know, I say words the way I want. And uh, <laughs> and and they are definitely, <laughs> thank you, identified as fucking UFOs a lot of the time. So it is a mystery that definitely um, cross permeates both disciplines. Unfortunately, since Chris is not here, he cannot raise this flag, but I will raise this flag right now for all of us blimps, but we'll oh, see what God happens. We'll see save, what happens. Save your breath. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Most folks would readily concede that the Earth's oceans have yet to reveal even a fraction of all of the mysterious beasts, both microscopic and colossal, that dwell within their vast, oft impenetrable depths. Some scientists have suggested that there are nearly a million undiscovered species lurking in the briny deep, while others insist that the number is a good deal higher. But while scientists have no problem accepting that the seas are chock full of as yet unidentified life forms, they reject the idea that the ocean of air above our heads might be just as full of unique and currently unclassified species. And to that, I'll add a little clarification. There's definitely scientists looking for uh, especially microscopic life up there, but no one's really looking for larger species that they just, you know, assume rightfully you will definitely find in the oceans. I mean, that's why we're here to bring these, uh, we got to bring these big questions. What big, big large killer shit is living in the atmosphere? (laughs) Too much. Exactly. Because I'm not smart enough to explain it from memory, here's a little tidbit on the not-so-fast stretch between us and the icy, death-filled vacuum of space I found in an encyclopedia entry on nationalgeographic.org. Quote, Earth's atmosphere stretches from the surface of the planet up to as far as 10,000 kilometers, or 6,214 miles, above. After that, the atmosphere blends into space. Not all scientists agree where the actual upper boundary of the atmosphere is, but they can agree that the bulk of the atmosphere is located close to the Earth's surface, up to a distance of around five to nine miles. While oxygen is necessary for most life on Earth, the majority of Earth's atmosphere is not oxygen. Our atmosphere is composed of about 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.9% argon, that's my favorite, (laughs) (laughs) 0.1% other gases, and trace amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, and neon. These are some of the gases that make up the remaining 0.1%. End I quote. mean, you you blew my tits off with all that information. I saw Argon, and I'm like, oh, yeah, he's that dude from Lord of the Rings that was fucking doing shit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's boy. Aragorn, so whatever. <laughs> I mean, it I goes... think at one point... Oh, like, go ahead. At one point, you and me and Chris actually had a, a conversation many years ago. We were like, dude, space is like three miles up, and we freaked ourselves out. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, yeah, but it's, it's so, so much close. more or I know, less. Exactly. Yeah, because exactly. Because there's like the, oh, I'll never say it right. There's like the Kimar line. I totally yeah. just Dude. made that up, but it starts with a K and there's an R. And that's like uh, like 64 miles up. And some people say that's the line between our atmosphere and space. Other people are like, oh, no, it's much more. It's It's a hotly debated subject, even amongst people that know shit, which we are not amongst. All right. So that's important, but we're not done. We're not done blowing your mind yet with fucking facts here. (laughs) So that was, that was from national geographic. Thank you. Here, here it goes back to me. It goes a lot more in depth describing different temperatures and oxygen volumes and layers like the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and exosphere. That's the one closest to space. I'm American and therefore indulgent and easily bored, so let's leave it at that. (laughs) Suffice it to say, the total mass of Earth's atmosphere is about 5.5 quadrillion tons, or roughly one millionth of the Earth's mass. In short, it's hella big. (laughs) Now let's take this frankly overwhelming figure and compare it to the collective amount of water said to be on the big blue orb we call home. According to mathematicians whose work I can only accept at face value because I can't check that shit, (laughs) we're dealing with the not insubstantial sum of approximately 326 million 
trillion gallons, which honestly leaves me just as perplexed as most of you. But to nail it on the head, there's a heck of a lot more real estate above than below. And if we are to concede that the ocean harbors scads of unknown life forms, how can we ignore the same potential in the vastly more expansive heavens above? I posit that question, Mark. How can we? I don't know if we can. Clearly, we're not going to. <laughs> we can't. It's this fucking matter, pod. <laughs> as a matter of fact, you just gave a bunch of information that I just felt like I was like in earth science, and I failed that fucking class hard every time I took it. So, so you're saying so, I, I, I made that shit dry as a popcorn fart, no, right? No, dude. It, it was moist and filled with indulgent ideas that my brain should be soaking up, and I'm awful with science. Hence, I am a maintenance mechanic who tears apart ship pumps. So- <laughs> So that's about as much as I fucking yeah. do. And shout outs to my earth science teacher, Mr. Clark. He's a good dude. I was an awful student and uh, I hope he's doing well. Yeah. And a shout out to my former earth science teacher, Mr. Carnicelli, probably oh. related to our own Chris. Yeah. I don't even know if he's alive anymore, but well, God bless him. He did his he best. He did go. his level best and he was a nice guy. And that <laughs> nice. counts. Or but we're not done with fucking science yet, buddy. All right, no. let's, let's do it's it. It's piles of science. All right, let's bring it. In the 1960s, pioneering microbiologist Tom Brock helped to redefine the boundaries of life when he observed bacteria growing at nearly boiling temperatures in Yellowstone National Park, opening a new field of biological study, extremophiles. This discovery of microorganisms that are capable of surviving in the harshest conditions on Earth opened a new window into the world of biology, allowing scientists to consider a much broader set of environments and conditions in which life as we know it can thrive. The race to discover new types of life in increasingly inhospitable environments was only intensified when, in 1977, legendary explorer Dr. Robert Ballard discovered an array of hydrothermal vents smoking deep below the Galapagos Islands, on which scores of unique species were said to, were, were able to thrive in the otherwise desolate, sunless world of the deep ocean floor. And to this, I got to say, get a personal shout out. I like to fall asleep to old documentaries a lot. National Geographic specials, Arthur C. Clarke, um, Mutual Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Just, it soothes me. There is a great National Geographic special specifically about these geothermal events and the guy, uh, Bob Ballard, who discovered them. Um, and he's also the guy who probably went on to a lot more fame in 1997 when he discovered the Titanic. So he's oh, like a legendary explorer and scientist, but that shit's fascinating. Nice. Cool. There are those who search the lower atmosphere with weather balloons equipped with catch traps designed to snare heretofore unknown microbial life. But for our purposes, let's discuss some of the more substantial creatures said to be lurking in the skies above our unsuspecting head. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I said head. Heads are unsuspecting head. Jesus nice. Christ, Rob. Read much? <laughs> Legends of so-called atmospheric monsters have been with humanity for centuries. Some are said to be gargantuan beasts, which have been incorrectly identified as flying saucers. Descriptions of these colossal creatures range from epic air whales and tentacled air krakens, the best, Awesome. To mammoth, semi-transparent floating jellyfish that dip in and out of the clouds with no visible means of aerodynamic propulsion. Fucking air whales. Come on. <laughs> Come on. Blimps. Fuck you. <laughs> on the other end of the scale are animals so small and swift that they can barely be perceived on frozen video frames, much less with the human eye. These include the off-debunked, slender, multi-winged, rods, or skyfish, which for the most part have been proven to be little more than fast-moving insects causing pre-high-def video to artifact, creating the illusion of an unidentified aerial anomaly. There are also more orb-like anomalies, but that that goes into the realm of paranormal and probably not in our purview. But yeah, You don't want to talk about a bunch, of, the, a bunch of dust balls that, that yeah, I took not, pictures uh, of? Yeah, I, I, I've seen some impressive video of... Uh, flying orbs and assuming it's not CGI or some other sort of special effect, uh, it could still be a large dust particle and a fan or a, a gust of wind or whatever. But 
I've seen when they switch directions pretty abruptly, uh, video that makes me go, huh, that could be intriguing, but by and large, you know, I don't give a fuck about orbs. So we'll put orbs away. <laughs> I did give a big old fuck about rods and skyfish, especially in the nineties. I think a lot yeah. of us fell into that hole right next to the, the hole where we all fell into the crop circles. And I'm not saying that there is nothing interesting about crop circles. I'm going to save that discussion for another day because right. there is, but a lot of it got kind of trashed once you saw what basically any yahoos with sticks and a, you know, rudimentary math skills could fucking get away with onto, yeah. onto rods and skyfish. Like it really looked like you were looking at like two and a half foot long, eight winged fucking stick bugs that yep. could like soar and twist and, and fly and blow your mind. And, and they were just too fast for the human eye. And all of that was so fascinating until you realized, oh yeah, video technology is shit. It was shit in the nineties. It was pretty much shit in the first decade of the 21st century. And now it's not so shit. And, uh, where have all the skyfish gone? <laughs> oh no. Is that the song at the plane, in the background? That's the song. Where have all the skyfish gone? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I've not seen Skyfish in, uh, in, in in a while since the advent of the iPhone. But you know, yeah, who knows? Maybe much. there's a, a Reddit page out there that just has a bunch of them listed. They're like, "Oh, here's my new rod of Monday" or whatever. It's but, worth doing a deep dive at some point because who knows? I'm maybe sure. there's new theories. There's a uh, high def video. Maybe just because it ran its course and it hasn't caught on yet, like a Fresno Nightcrawler or something. You know that right. the, the kids seem to like. Maybe there is something out there where I can. Uh, have my love renewed, but yeah, I definitely, maybe. I definitely feel like I've broken up with rods All somewhere right, well, along the way. You know, thank God. <laughs> so these tiny little bastards. Okay, <laughs> fitting somewhere in between the mastodonic and microscopic are airborne man-eating super amoebas. More on that in a second. <laughs> Vaporous quasi-humanoid cloud-like beings, translucent sky rays one-eyed, multi-flippered, headless rectangles, and even gargantuan clam-like gliders that are definitely not fucking blimps. <laughs> For the record. Crashing blimps. <laughs> it seems impossible that such a vast menagerie could manage to exist unnoticed. But in 1975, pioneering UFO author Trevor James Constable proposed that the flying saucer phenomenon was likely not an example of extraterrestrial technology, but of colossal amoeba-like creatures that dwell in the Earth's atmosphere. Earth's atmosphere. I'm giving myself tongue twisters. He dubbed these theoretical animals critters. Constable further posited that these atmospheric abominations spent most of their time in a virtually invisible, low-density state. But when they increased their density, while... Jesus Christ, now I'm fucking... Now I'm Marty McFly or his dad. <laughs> you are my density. <laughs> while in search of sustenance, these odd life forms became visible to the naked eye. Could this be the reason these things are so rarely seen by the thousands of pilots and passengers traversing the airways every day? Could most of these so-called critters be so insubstantial that our solid steel aircraft rip them to shreds without so much as a tremor of turbulence? As to why the remains of these creatures are never found, it has been suggested that, much like animals that dwell in the pressurized depths of the deepest ocean trenches, these atmospheric animals are unable to survive on the surface of the earth and would dissolve long before they ever reach the ground. Some even believe that examples of the gelatin-like star jelly, the ones that aren't frog spooge, so often found following meteor showers may well be the rotting remains of these lighter than air invertebrates. So uh, I don't know if you know what star jelly is, but it's just this whatever hunks of blubbery, you know, jelly like shit on the ground that some people think are, you know, I don't know, creatures that landed. Um, there's, we can do a whole thing on that at some point, but okay. it's pretty much, um, detritus from uh you know frog spawning i think that's what it's been confirmed to be mostly like but frogs, maybe not all examples of that like frogs fucking they leave behind a big mess sort of i really oh. i should have boned up on this a little more okay. i guess you know but i i didn't so we'll just leave it at that we don't have to bone up on frog fucking that's fine ah, speak for yourself <laughs> all right perhaps <laughs> tiny 
chunks of space rock strike these things in mid-flight, tearing them apart with the force of their impact and sending them hurtling earthward in as yet unidentifiable gelatinous hunks which dissolve away near instantaneously, which is what Star Jelly is said to do. Constable also believed that the use of radar devices in the 20th century somehow disturbed these sky beasts, forcing them from their usually concealed state into a more perceptible one. If sonar can have such profoundly adverse effects on marine mammals, and they absolutely do, they they hurt the fuck out of porpoises and whales, then I suppose anything is possible with sky amoebas. Constable was not alone in his belief in atmospheric animals. Famed adventurer, zoologist, nature author, and paranormal investigator Ivan T. Sanderson was so enamored with the idea of extant species of sky beasts occupying the skies, he speculated that numerous UFO accounts might actually represent, quote, extremely low-density animals native to the clouds, end quote. Even celebrated cosmologist Carl Sagan got into the act when he proposed that some kind of astrobiological balloon-like beast might be soaring through the skies of massive gas giants such as Jupiter, though it is doubtful that he ever speculated that one or more of these creatures may have found their way to Earth or that we harbor our own indigenous population of such creatures. As if the thought of huge hovering amoebas weren't enough, Constable went on to suggest the literally horrifying premise that these critters were not only carnivorous, but that they were likely responsible for the plethora of inexplicable animal mutilations, as well as the hundreds of human beings who go missing every year. All right, that's kind of heavy. So not not only are you, are you talking about like, well, yeah, we got these creatures, you're like, they're carnivorous, they eat shit, and they'll fuck you up. Yeah, they just dip and- down. They just live from the, the clouds. You're like, oh, that dude's tasty as fuck. Get yeah, down, not, chomp, chomp, out. Not That's cool. fucked up. Yeah, no, I, I, we have enough problems on the earth, man. We don't need shit from the sky coming down. Like, I can't. What are you going to do? I know we've talked about it before, but that just sucks. That thought yeah. literally blows in the worst totally. possible way. That's a super yeah. toothy blow right there. Yeah. And, and what do you? It's not do? cool. No, I mean, like, it's like tremors in the sky. Like, what do you fucking do? How, how do you defend yourself from those Tremors things? in the sky. Yeah, man. Like, the Ghost fuck, tremors gotta... in the sky. Yeah, That's dude. You got to go up the, that poor bastard went up the fucking power pole there. He went up the, he went up the, the whole pole and died. Oh, yeah. And, and then he and died of thing. dehydration. That's yeah, the first dude. one. Yeah. Yeah. Local, but now it's coming you know, from the, wino. Come from the sky, I, man. You could say that. You got to. You got to run and duck and cover and, and hope to shit these things go away. <laughs> oh, <laughs> or hopefully shit. they just don't exist. That'd be even better, but we'll see. Needless to say, the thought of huge, voracious, virtually undetectable predators that can descend from the sky in a flash to claim their unwary victims is far from comforting. Needless to say, the thought of of huge, voracious, virtually undetectable predators that can descend from the sky in a flash to claim their unwary victims is far from a comforting one. Perhaps it was Constable's alarming theory that inspired Japan's Toho Studios to produce Dagora the Space Monster. You know that classic. Dagora, a massive floating jellyfish-like creature that hovered over Japan, scooping up its terrified victims, was brought to life by renowned Godzilla collaborators Ishiro Honda and special effects wizard Eiji Tsuburaya in 1964 and may well be the best live-action cinematic articulation of an atmospheric monster yet created. Hell yeah. While Dagora is well known to kaiju enthusiasts, arguably the most celebrated real-life encounter with... An alleged atmospheric monster hailed from Crawfordsville, Il- Indiana. I almost said Illinois, Indiana. <laughs> the event in question began at about 2 a.m. on September 4th, 1891, when two men who were repairing a wagon looked skyward to see what they described as a horrible apparition. The events in question began at about 2 a.m. on September 4th, 1891, when two men who were re- who were, excuse me, repairing a wagon, looked skyward to see what they described as a horrible apparition, quote unquote. The men asserted that the multi-finned, rectangular, headless creature, who bore no less than a single cycloptic red eye, swam effortlessly through the air less than 100 feet above them. 
The men gauged the thing's size to be approximately 8 feet wide and 20 feet in length. They would later confirm to reporters of the Indianapolis Journal that the bizarre airborne beast was definitely animate. In the spate of encounters that followed, which we covered in depth in episode 67, The Crawfordsville Monster, which was one of my fucking favorites, honestly, when I think back to pods I've had fun doing that ranks amongst the top. Yeah, that was definitely fun. The critter writhed and wheezed in apparent agony as it dove down on the scores of spectators, covering them in its hot breath and compelling more than a few of these terrified witnesses to believe that for such a thing to descend upon them surely meant that the end of the world must be nigh. Oh, nigh. shit. <laughs> the <laughs> end is nigh. I mean, if you see that shit and you are definitely... <laughs> And I don't know what part of the Bible Belt is represented by Indiana. I don't think it's technically the Bible Belt. Maybe it is. But, you know, you're living in rural 1800s Indiana, and you see yeah, this shit. I mean, you're definitely looks, thinking Sky yeah, Leviathan. And it's I know fucking, there's a word for it. It's a fucking sky demon all of a sudden fucking comes out. You're like, clearly it's the devil. Clearly we fucked up. Waiting for Yahweh. Let's see what happens. Boom. There it is. Another entirely different breed of atmospheric entity is said to dwell above the tiny islands off of Scotland's Shetland archipelago. The Shetland Islands are a remote and misshrouded locale about 50 miles northeast of, northeast of Orkney, and it should come as no surprise to any student of the unknown that they are known to harbor a monster. But unlike the famed lake beasties of the Scottish Highlands, the thing that the islanders know, know only as it, quote unquote, is quite unlike any other creature on earth. The locals believe this vaporous varmint is a cloud animal that dwells in the skies above and for reasons unknown occasionally makes the journey to terra firma. Those who have come into contact with this organism have met with no harm and report the physical sensation that the physical sensation is akin to being licked by, quote, an enormously soft tongue, end oh, quote. All right. <laughs> no. you might, come on. A, you know, know. a little bit of couth here, a little bit of like, hey, I'm just going to lick you. Don't, but you're standing there all of a sudden. Like, and ah, you just fuck. get this big old oh. sloppy soft tongue going up the length of your body. Oh. Is that it, the which wind I'm sure or for a some lick? people would be oh. delightful, uh, but ah. all right. All While right, the yeah. effect may not be fatal or even injurious, it is certainly distasteful. That's my opinion. Though some may surmise that sh the Shetlands are being protected by their own overzealous cloud puppy, which is frankly fucking adorable. Oh, it's the cloud puppins. See, I, now I, you're I, not thinking it's so bad yeah, after all. I wrote it off as a weird sky sex offender, and now I think it's a, it's a cute cloud puppins. It just wants to come by and give you the old fucking puppins lick. It like it's a, anything, it's an invisible you know? felcor. It's just coming yeah. down, Aww, giving yeah. you a big old lick, saying, hey, what's yeah. up? Or he's like mm. some squinty-eyed fucking sex offender, like you say. <laughs> some grizzled old dude with fucking <laughs> yellow teeth and fucking a, a big giant home-rolled buck. You can't buy oh, him that boy. big. Giving you a big old lick saying, yeah. Yeah, I'm your like sky that. puppy fucker. Here I go. I'm going to be your sky puppy, buddy. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm coming for you, buddy. I hope no one ever says You're that sky to puppy. I'm going to be your sky puppy. Yeah, yeah, please, please if don't. If we get ourselves in a situation in life where we're someone's sky puppy, that's on us, apparently. So yeah. I don't know. No. You, know what, you know what we did? Better decisions. We, we completely Groot slanged ourselves at that point. We definitely did. <laughs> For Let's sure. Let's just stick with the cute sky puppy. Yeah. The Shetland man, let's sky just stay puppy. There. Totally. It's a thing. Make t shirts. Toads adorbs. Nevertheless, encounters with it have a tendency to leave the human experiencers rattled. One such, one such incident reported by an unnamed police officer details a run-in with this entity that occurred while he was bicycling on his normal patrol route. And that always makes me think of uh, Island of Terror, the great old Peter Cushing, Terrence Fisher, sci-fi you know, horror film with the silicates that look like turtle vacuums. I know I've talked about it before, but anyway, mm -hmm. the cop in that one on this like isolated little island just rode around on a bike and fucking defended the law. God bless him. But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> that is neither here nor there, but that's what this dude was doing. I think the the only time I've ever like really seen police like on a bike, like I mean, obviously here in New York, that's not a thing, and where where we live in New York, but I was I was in Mexico and they had um, the federales or, or whatever, you know, like on their like bikes, like mountain bikes. 
but they're fucking armed to the tits. I'm like, who are the dudes with submachine guns in super dope mountain bikes? I'm like, oh, those are the cops. Those yeah, the they're going to be able cops. to get to places quick, and yeah. uh, and yep. where cars can't go. So that's pretty Apparently. terrifying and awesome. Yeah, there you but go. anyway, safety. Back to the Shetlands. This lawman claimed that it enveloped him creating the sensation of being wrapped in a quote, soft blanket that smelled of mildew. <laughs> I mean, nice not, and not good. allergenic. No, I guess. Gross. It's gross. I don't like mildew. I'm highly allergic. Always no, makes me sneeze. It's disgusting. Every time I get a book from England, I have to like go through it with like a, a dryer sheet and put it in a baggie and just put it away for like three months and hope that I can breathe when I read it. Or then I have to glove up and mask up. <laughs> just mold. It's true. It's happened England. more than once. Well, <laughs> oh, it's man. not their fault. It's like so goddamn moist and ancient that fucking, that's just what happens. <laughs> it comes that's with England fucking, for you. It comes with King Arthur must like fuck again. Dude, the first time I went to England back in like 1990, I thought, Oh my God, this smells like what PBS looks like. It's like mildew and mothballs oh, and <laughs> and I guess the the archaic scent of a rich and varied history. All right, I'm not fair. saying it was terrible, but it was All distinctive right. and it was almost exactly like I imagined it was. Uh, fucking tally ho. There you go. Yeah. All right. There it is. <laughs> there it pip, is. Pip. <laughs> the being, which the officer was convinced was alive, swiftly soared away, but the shaken officer claimed that it had been one of the most terrifying experiences of his entire life. So not everyone uh, loves right. the fucking Shetland Sky Puppy. I mean, Fair. when you're, you know, just trying to do your your rounds as a police officer and the thing comes down and tries to give you the old lick, some people don't like sky puppies. What are you gonna do? It it is a little violating. Yeah, uh, you like, know there are I mean, boundaries. Permissions well, should be granted. I mean, sky puppies give no fucks. So, well, no puppies give fucks. That's uh, part of that's, the deal with puppies. Uh, yeah, let's just hope it's true. a puppy. Let's just <laughs> let's just go Fine. with that. Let's a mildewy old big old puppy, all right, old sheep perfect. dog. Perfect. But not all encounters with these creatures are invisible. In fact, there are many cases in which one of these monsters was allegedly captured on film. Since the dawn of photography, there have been scores of photos of alleged UFO sightings that do not seem to have the classic earmarks of a machine-tooled vehicle or surveillance device. These anomalous objects seem to have strange, almost organic shapes and move in ways that seem counterintuitive for a flying craft. One of the most intriguing anomalous UFO photographs, which may well represent a genuine atmospheric monster, was taken by scientific journalist Bruno Gibaudi. I think I'm saying that right. On April on excuse me, April 27th, 1961. On the afternoon in question, Gibaudi was driving along the highway that ran adjacent to the Mont Silvano Beach in Italy when he blew a tire. Undoubtedly angered by this development, Gibaudi immediately pulled over and began changing his flat, never realizing that this momentary inconvenience would set the table for an event that would change his life forever. The tire changing was proceeding smoothly when Gibaudi suddenly noticed a bizarre, multi-winged or possibly finned quote-unquote object soaring over the ocean at a low altitude. The strange craft was heading directly toward him at an incredible rate of speed, but much to his credit, Gibaudi did not freeze or panic. Instead, he reached into his car and retrieved his camera. As the odd object passed overhead, it slowed and made a sharp northward turn, and Gibaudi managed to snap a single photo of the UFO before it accelerated out of sight. While some claim that the image shows an interstellar vehicle, there are many who believe that what is depicted in the image is actually a living and possibly breathing creature. It's a really interesting image. It looks like a knobby sort of UFO, something like not quite as uh, shell-like as the ships from Buckaroo Banzai, but but it's pretty esoteric. I've seen the image. We will we'll probably post a link to it or whatever. Yeah, for um, sure. I'm, I'm on the fence as to whether or not I think it's organic. But okay. it, it's an argument that's been made, so we're presenting it. There you go. Another stirring image comes to us from a New Zealand photographer named Michael White, who was shooting pictures when he noticed what he described as a, quote, strange looking dark cloud, end quote, overhead. Apparently, the cloud remained immobile for the better part of half an hour. I guess it's doable when it suddenly disappeared. 
White had managed to snap multiple photographs. Thank you. Multiple photographs. There you Your go. Your body, you can take a note, unless you had one of those old crank fuckaroos that just <laughs> takes a picture an hour. But it always makes me, you know how I feel about the one photo protocol. Dude. Sandra Mancy. Oh, God damn it. Take more pictures, people. Come oh, on. Just take all the pictures you have. If it's the last yeah. one on the roll, then fucking, I don't know. Pull out your sketchbook. Do something. Do something. Paint it nude, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Fucking get into its head. <laughs> fucking really make it art, but find a way. If, right. you, if you have a full roll of film, fuck your kids. You can buy more fucking film. Yeah. Take all of the photos of the monster slash UFO all the time. I know it doesn't matter anymore. It's the 21st century, so I'm arguing with the past. <laughs> I get I'm doing that. <laughs> I mean, it? not a waste of time at all. Isn't that just what we do? Just That's argue what we do. Past. We argue with the past. I know. So, uh. <laughs> so I get, it's a waste. And, but it, you know, you you have digital technology. If any of you out there have this happen, take 150 fucking photos from multiple angles. Take video. Tell everyone around you to do the same, even if they yeah. think it's fucking nothing or stupid it make them do it bribe them you know fucking we'll put out a reward plans just f- all right all right <laughs> all right all right back on we're back okay. on, we're back in new zealand with mike all white right. doing Perfect. the thing let's, let's half do hour it. cloud <laughs> okay he took <laughs> it, multiples it could, it could be morrissey we don't know oh my god but it wasn't until he later developed the images that he realized how unique this entity was in the photo the mysterious object resembled a sort of rippling possibly organic magic carpet. The most intriguing part of White's story is that he claims that he did not notice the object when he took the picture. White described the cloud he saw as fibrous and peculiar looking. He even went so far as to state that he believed the weird cloud could sense that it was being filmed and vanished as a result. Dude, it's Morrissey. Yeah, it definitely is Morrissey. (laughs) Totally. (laughs) He's just up there singing his sad songs, being a dick. Oh my God, just he's rippling in the sky with great hair. Just wishing he was still in the Smiths. Being all fibrous. I know, there you go. Morrissey is want to be. There you go. Does this imply that this fibrous cloud-like shape was merely camouflage for a potentially sentient living being? If this happens to be the case, and I'm not suggesting it is, then it gives rise to the supposition that strange undulating entities may be cruising overhead all of the time and that our all and that all our human eyes ever perceive are plain old ordinary puffy clouds. If that is true, then our world is a mysterious place indeed. Best camo ever. Holy shit. Yeah, no doubt. <clears throat> yeah. So I mean that's really the ultimate thing that we have to contend with here. If these things really can't be seen, or if they're just visible on a spectrum that our eyes don't capture, which Mm -hmm. is almost all of them, um, then, then you would think maybe some of the technology we have would have caught up, but maybe they don't register on FLIR. Maybe they're not giving off the, I don't know, heat in that right way, but, but maybe there are cameras that just, you know, usually aren't randomly aimed at the sky for no fucking good reason that Mm -hmm. could capture these things. And if you got the right, um, I don't know, spectrum or whatever it would be, uh, we might see that these, the fucking skies are just chock full of jellyfish and fucking air whales and fucking super kraken and you know vaporous dudes that are just hanging out and it's like a fucking cocktail party and who the fuck knows but we just don't ever see it or deal with it i'm not saying it is but i wish it was because they don't really fuck with us that much unless they're you know coming down and randomly eating fuckos from time to time I mean, if we did see them, all we would see them is getting just massacred by planes. Like every time a helicopter oh. went by, you'd be like, oh shit. Can you <laughs> imagine what drones fucking... are doing? Oh, oh God, that would I suck. Know, right? if every every time something went, like a kite just started slicing through them, like a katana. Birds. Like every time a frisbee <laughs> shot up just a little too high, yeah, birds are oh, just not plowing a through. I love frisbee. It's my favorite yard not game. Not after you see it turn into the fucking flying guillotine. Oh, man. Well, I mean, I, I, yeah, God. We got to battle for the skies, I guess, for the freedom of frisbees. Or maybe so. we're just like we're mass murderers. Maybe we're constantly slaughtering these things. They just want to fucking float around. I don't know, collect their particles, live live in their photosynthetic way where they're just basking in energy and just trying to fucking do their thing, and we're just killing them I left mean, and right. Uh, it's not on purpose. We're not save warring the sky with whale, people. dude. Yeah, dude, save, save the sky it. whale, bro. Nuke the whales. No, I love that shirt. By the way, when I was young, I had one of those nuke <laughs> the whales. I felt like whales. I think I discovered irony like literally three days before I saw that shirt hanging in some shop somewhere, and I'm like, I get it. 
it's not cool, but that's why it's cool. I get it. It's not cool. And I fucking put it on and my little man boy boobs were hanging out and I didn't give a fuck. So I'm like, this is a white nuke t-shirt with an iron on and, I, and it says nuke the whales and I'm going to fucking wear it for all it's worth. Uh, but if someone were- wants to save the sky whales and do a t-shirt, uh, that would be wicked. You were Bart Simpson. There you go. Perfect. Oh my God. Totes. <laughs> Okay, back to the story. On the afternoon of November 3rd, 1973, a Mexican banker and his family spied a strange object rocketing in a westerly direction over uh, Cocoyoc. I'm trying to read that in advance, Mexico. The banker's wife claimed that the object was roundish and did not resemble any traditional aircraft that she knew of. The banker stopped his car for a better look at the unusual object, and he and the passengers exited the vehicle and watched as the UFO shot across the sky. Thankfully, he had the presence of mind to grab his camera, and he took a single fucking photo of the spiky anomaly before it shot out of view. Was this some sort of weird sky anemone? Or merely a very strange balloon caught in the wind. That's another photo we can we can put up. It's just a spiky fuck all. A decade earlier, in 1963, in North Cliff, South Africa, a real estate agent was taking pictures of available houses for a local newspaper advertisement when she captured an image of a truly unique UFO. The object resembles a strange sort of cellular structure. Perhaps this is a picture of one of Constable's amoeba-like critters, or maybe it's something else altogether. And that's weird. That's weird, but we'll break these down in a, a little bit. The above cases represent merely a handful of the accounts and photographs of what might be atmospheric monsters or sky beasts. But as many images as may be out there, the general consensus remains that these animals can not only modify their size and density seemingly at will, but also employ a unique form of camouflage to conceal themselves. This means that if these creatures really do exist, there may be thousands, if not millions, floating above us at this very moment. Which is what we just talked about a minute ago. And again, a potentially haunting, potentially comforting. I mean, if they're pretty much innocuous... Uh, maybe we would just feel less alone, you know, just knowing that there's all these things. Then again, I never like look up in the sky and see a bird and think, oh, life has meaning. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I guess I don't know like how no, much if, spiritual fulfillment I'm going to get no, from fucking dude, sky zero. Me, it would just be fucking terror. There's no like, I feel fulfilled. <laughs> there's none of that shit. You're like, oh fuck, there's a bunch of shit in the sky that I didn't know and about. And they're going to constantly be like eating yes, each other. Like they're going to be whipping their little cool, flagellum dude. or whatever and they're going to spin yeah. at each other and then they're going to open their mouths and eat one and then and then if you can see them, then you can hear them because that's how it works. That's science. Yeah. And they're going to scream. So the skies will be full of screams and carcasses and things eating other things. And they're going to look like uh, shit that would make Hieronymus Bosch go, all right, fuck this. I'm done. Yeah. This is weird. Exactly. So you're right. I I take back the comforting thing. There's no spiritual comfort. Just fucking terror. (laughs) Just complete terror. Right now. Fucking in an orgy of violence right above us. (laughs) There you go. (laughs) The origins of these creatures, assuming that they exist at all, not surprisingly remains a point of contention between those already securely within the pro-atmospheric monsters exist camp. Some supporters believe that we are likely dealing with alien entities of unknown extraction, strange wandering exobiological beasts who either feed off the cosmic rays and become accidentally trapped in Earth's gravity, or active predators who, like a python digesting a big meal for months, can survive for long stretches in a near hibernation state, drifting through the cosmos until they are drawn to our planet where they can prey on whatever meat they can find, be it insect, bird, cow, or human. Jesus. All right. Sky predators. Calm down. (laughs) Pump the brakes. (laughs) Pump hey, the brakes. It's called speculating. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know, that's what you got to do. All Hypothesis. Right, creepy. All right. Creepy. Creepy. Others contend that these creatures are as indigenous to Earth as dogs or cats, and they've evolved, like so many other extremophiles, to live in unique niche, niche environments that would kill nearly any other species. 
Most believe that wherever these beasts come from, they are non-sentient animals that live their skybound lives reliant on instinct rather than intellect. Others think they may be intelligent visitors or explorers who, for whatever reason, have set up shop in our atmosphere. Of course, they could both be right or wrong. Perhaps these stories and speculations are nothing more than flights of fancy, pun sadly intended. But if just one of these cases proves to be genuine, then it means that our scientists have barely scraped the surface of the fauna that lives below on or above this world oh shit atmospheric monsters attack bobby god damn i know all right well it's fascinating uh, we got some pictures to look at so for the purposes of this in the the in the description of this podcast there is going to be a link to a mysterious universe article that was originally written by rob uh, the byline has been removed uh this was some years ago we obviously Rob has reworked this for the pod, but by all means, click at this, you know, click this link again in the description of the podcast and let's follow along and look at some really fucked up pictures. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is interesting. Let's go first to the, uh, Gibaudi, uh, picture, which is interesting because in the context of the article, I, I found a painting that is based on the actual photograph, which is fairly fucking blurry. So it's worth comparing and contrasting both images. I think the painter did a great job. (laughs) It's like Renaissance weird shit in the sky. It's great. It's fucking awesome. Oh, totally. I mean, it it is weird. This is the one I I mentioned earlier. It looks gray, almost porpoise-like. But of course, I mean, I guess the gray is based on Gibaudi's, um, you know, uh, eyewitness account of it. But, uh, but but it does ha- it does seem like almost like slick I, I, seal skin maybe, but it also yeah. looks like it could have weird flight um uh you know wings I, what do they call them like flight uh I don't know it, it has no some aviator. sort of method of propulsion I guess well, in it the doesn't, sky but it doesn't though it, it really it could be a weird aqua bug. Like it looks like a cross yeah. between a weird fish and an insect to me, but it right. also could be a flight surface. I think that's where I was looking for a ship with just weird flight surfaces that don't seem to correlate with anything that should keep you aloft, uh, right. at least in Earth's atmosphere. So yeah, it's, I'm intrigued it's, it's by this weird. one, though I will say on the actual photograph, um, there seems to be an additional top wing that isn't represented in the painting. Yep. So that's intriguing. Hmm. Um, okay. and, uh, yeah, you can click on it, but it doesn't, I don't think it enlarges it any. Oh, it does. If you click on it twice, it will enlarge oh, nice. the images. Nice. So as far as that one's concerned, it's interesting, but I wouldn't go out of my way, uh, to say that it was, um, not a vehicle. Yeah. The it, next, I mean, it's, it's still cool looking. Oh, it's still cool. Yeah, the next sure. one's actually one I, I skipped in the, in the redux, um, but I'll, I'll read it here really quickly. This next picture was also allegedly taken in Italy. While there's not a lot of information surrounding this image, its uniqueness warranted its inclusion in this article. According to online accounts, this photo was snapped in the middle of the day sometime in July of 1999 by an unnamed Italian dentist. Supposedly the object, which looks like a stubby a uh, tentacled squid kind of was reportedly silent, exceedingly large and soaring at an incredibly high altitude and rate of speed. Some of the witnesses claimed that the UFO had lights along its base. Hmm. Were these artificial lights or examples of bioluminescence? No, May- maybe we'll never know, but the image itself is interesting. I don't see the lights, whether they're artificial or not, yeah, but it no. does sort of um, almost like a, a weird version of the awakening squids, but not really. It's like a phallic thing with a bulbous top and, uh, and five big ba- arms on its base, I guess. It's like someone, a better term. Y- yeah. Like someone threw a squid and took a picture like fuck snap yeah. or like That's a toy squid that like is got a suction cup bottom that you stick to a wall. Oh yeah. Just or like it up a, in the air, like a rubber chicken maybe or something, but yeah. And, totally. and it looks to be like greenish gray. It's, definitely reflecting light i mean it's probably yeah, in the sky weird but a complete lack of context for something that shot on a you know plain blue sky or maybe a right. fucking wall for all we know is difficult to uh to assess yeah all it's right, a let's weird move crop on to um yeah it's a really bad crop it would be nice to have context to michael 
white uh from new zealand uh the photograph that he took of what he said was like a cloud at first mm-hmm. and, and and then it looked kind of like a um what, what did he say like a tapestry uh fibrous magic carpet who you're looking magic it carpet was, it was morrissey yes so you're looking at this image now right. i'm looking yep. at it and i'm yep. not thinking magic carpet though i get that if that's your frame of reference i'm thinking flying hedora to go back to kaiju yeah. bill definitely has a flying hedora feel possibly a sky clam with no shell and that was my second thought sky I'm glad clam, you went there. Yeah. this yeah. looks a lot like what the gargantuan gliders were described as totally no, that nothing about this is blimp like in any way shape or form and i, I mean, know you're alone and you don't have chris to help defend your goddamn <laughs> asinine zeppelin theories but i i stand by this this might be <laughs> okay. what the sky clams really look like if this was a blimp that was crashing and or deflated, it would look like that. All right, it fair enough. Defin- it, 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 it's not like it's out of the realms of possibility of like, there's a blimp, it's deflated and falling down, like, and just kind of like going back down to the sky. Like, it would 100% look like that. What do they call the thing, the gondola or whatever that hangs beneath where people actually ride? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a gondola. I I, I don't know. I, I don't know for a, sure either. This a, this lacks sort that. Of cockpit. But- but I've never, I mean, I know blimps explode, you know, the humanity, fucking Hindenburg. We, we, I, <laughs> really? <laughs> but I don't humanity? know about any cases, although I'm sure it's happened, of a <clears throat> blimp deflating in midair. It would Could probably it a, look like that. Yeah, or like a weather balloon or something. You know, or a like weather a balloon. Control, yeah. All right, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, caught on the wind. Yep. Uh, so it would have to be super light. It's just mm-hmm. catching the rays in just the right way. Because when you see the original photo, it's just this fine speck in the distance so we don't actually know how it's moving or if it's moving because it's a still fucking photograph not a video yeah he was focused on the you know immobile cloud Mm -hmm. and and then just when he looked at the photo later you know sussed this out oh it's weird it's interesting totally i'm i'm intrigued by it but yeah sure i guess it could be organic why the fuck not yeah shit sky clams there you go sky clams all right November 3rd, 1973, The Mexican Banker. This one's pretty cool. This one's weird. I know I said sky anemone, but really, no. This is, what does this remind me of? It looks like a fucking floating turnip with (laughs) spindly (laughs) legs kind of sticking around the center and hanging out. It looks like an Ultraman kaiju, actually. <laughs> it, it, it really does. Like. It's some weird, weird random fucking kaiju thing hanging I mean, out. It but definitely yeah. does not look like any ships. I mean, it looks sputnik I guess. So it looks like things that don't need yeah. to be aerodynamic to soar around the fucking, you know, the perimeter of the Earth in space. But it doesn't look like anything that could be, I guess, a balloon. I, I, I yeah. just, you know, and I mean, of course, of this could these- be a balloon are giving me like a weather balloon fucking vibe, you know, yeah. like this, people were like launching this shit back in the day, you know, just like random independent balloonists just letting their shit go. And then independent people meteorologist are, with their yeah, independent people are fucking balloons. Seeing these things, man, they're trying to get their art up there in the air to like express themselves like to their countrymen. And then they're just like getting pictures being like, Oh, it's a fucking sky amoeba. And really it's just someone's fucking dope art project. Or it's a fucking, yeah extraterrestrial UFO. vehicle what it could be totally i mean, be a weird I mean drone. that's one thing we really can't take off the table for all of these because i mean yeah. any one of these could be organic any one of these could be artificial and who knows i mean maybe the vehicles that contain you know the youth knots youth knots mm-hmm. um are organic in some way i mean you can't really rule that yeah. out any more than anything else all right let's end this on the 1963 north cliff uh Johannesburg, South Africa, real estate uh, image. Now, this one seems closest to the uh, the Trevor James Constable Sky Meba. It it has a con well contrail is the wrong word. It's got trail that implies it's moving from left to right as you're looking at the photograph. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it looks like I don't know, like to me, like close ups of multiplying cells. It's just got a white. <laughs> Outer it's kind of weird. Like four little things inside that look like developing embryos or something. Like a almost like a weird honeycomb pattern. Like yeah, I definitely see that. 
or like a meteor or something. It is bizarre. It's, I mean, and you kind of get relation with the house and like the, the power line right there, like where exactly it is. Huh. Yeah. So either that, it's that's, gigantic that was, and far away or right. relatively small and very close. Yeah, that one's pretty interesting, actually. That's just like, I mean, obviously, could this thing, well, I don't know if you could really fake that in the air, but you could, unless maybe it's a weird, like a something on the photo that like. That's like what I would say. If it, burned I, I, I or think something? it would be less faked and more like maybe a chemical problem or yeah, maybe. you put it, something it, on there and yeah. uh, while it was being huh. developed and it pressed in and it gave the impression of something moving and yeah. anomalous and bubbled up and you just can't tell in a two dimensional re- reproduction of it. Yeah, or no, something definitely. Interesting but it's, going on. It's definitely pretty interesting there. So, so Robert, um, what what do you think with all of these different airborne anomalies? Possibility of these things being carnivorous fuckalls that are floating above us, ready to eat us, or possible, you know, non nuts and bolts crafts. I guess maybe psychic projections from Venus that are just fucking popping into our reality. What do you? Oh, think? I like that one. That's yeah, my favorite one. That's full psychic right projections there. from Venus. Yes, full Jacques Valley. I think as vast and disparate, say, as the species in the ocean are, and it is sort of misleading to compare, even though I did it extensively, the ocean to the sky, because um, they're completely different habitats. One is just designed to harbor life, at least life as we know it, which absolutely requires water. Um, And another environment um, is one where living things can move through it, but don't generally speaking live in it. Um, But but it doesn't mean that's not possible. So I think they're probably as vast and disparate as, as the creatures living in the ocean. If they exist at all, they might not be as numerous and there might not be nearly as many, but I mean, you've got sea snakes and jellyfish and lobsters and fucking sharks and fucking sea turtles on and on. These things Mm -hmm. have different agendas, different biology. They come from, uh, different places. They definitely have different evolutionary paths. And there's no reason to assume that if there are things that, you know, extremophiles, which they would have to be, um, that are lighter than air, likely invertebrates living in there, that they might have, uh, at least some diversity in that. Now, maybe some of it was captured extraterrestrials, but assuming it's indigenous to earth, then I think, um, that, that the possibility is that we just have a form of life that is very difficult to um, to capture, to engage with. I don't, as, you know, as cool in a horror film way as it sounds, I don't buy uh, Constable's theory of the descending hypercarnivorous amoeba. I mean, it, it definitely, you know, it's a, it's a good theory to like clean up loose ends on missing persons cases that you can't figure out in cattle mutilations. But, but to me, that doesn't really, you know, pan out. How can you be low density and then wish yourself to be solid and then come down with your, I, I guess, absorbing powers of the blob and just suck fuckers in and Dude, dissolve them? A- all about the power of positive thinking. If Tony Robbins has taught us nothing, you just <laughs> wish yourself into fucking existence and you go and you eat people and you're like, fuck off. And then you run away with your sustenance. <laughs> you there have you to say fuck off as you go. Like, fuck but, all right. So, you know, you're catching me up here. So if there is something <laughs> that can will density, um, <laughs> then fuck, that's crazy. That's a new I mean, kind of life form. I mean, it's a bad I, idea that I ran with. Please don't take it. I mean, but you can't rule out anything. I mean, in a universe no. of infinite possibilities, possibilities anything is possible but some things are more likely than others i would say uh the more likely scenario would not be uh willful density the mark stores theory but um but probably things that are really light really really diaphanous um probably translucent more often than not maybe don't even get hit by the light if they're truly not just semi-transparent but truly translucent Mm -hmm. um uh that are just so malleable that they're just basically like just imagine bubbles basically but if they were like flat and semi-organic and 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 maybe have rudimentary organs but nothing you'd need to or maybe even nothing we'd understand you know a Mm -hmm. biologist would probably have a field day if they could even get it under a microscope or touch it with a pair of tweezers or a scalpel which it might not be possible it might just dissipate when it gets anywhere near the earth that would be what i would think these just bubble like fuck alls that maybe they're attacking each other maybe they're getting their energy from the sun maybe they're feeding on uh microorganisms that just are and we know they're micro microorganisms galore in the atmosphere right. maybe that they just eat and they just fill that that you know ecological niche um 
I don't know, but that would be what I would be more inclined to think. Do I want there to be fucking sky whales? Yes. Do I wish there would be hyper jellyfish as long as they're not like man of war types or like venomous or, or dicks? Sure. Do I want planes to be tearing them apart? No. But if they're even, even have just a little bit of intelligence and, you know, animal level intelligence, like a jellyfish, like where it's not even a, a nervous system and a brain, nervous system and a brain, but they can still avoid predators. Um, you know, then planes aren't that common. Like pl- planes aren't crisscrossing the sky at infinitum. You can see right. that shit coming from a while, a while <clears throat> or a ways away, whatever I'm trying to say and get the fuck out of Dodge. So I don't imagine it's a constant massacre though. If they do get caught unawares and get splat, then it probably wouldn't make any difference. Maybe there'd be a different sheen on the windshield for a split second and, and probably no oh. one would be any of the wiser fucking blimp goo so i do think that there's probably (laughs) creatures up there i want them to be fucking the whales and the krakens or vaporous cloud people in in terms of uh um leaving that aside in terms of like the cloudy weird things well we dealt with that a little bit in the carnivorous pink cloud we certainly dealt with Mm -hmm. that in the sky spitter episode way back in the day so i mean there are people that have seen what seem to be sentient or at least intelligently directed if not self-aware uh vaporous entities and if that's the case that could be just a whole different breed of cat like i say as far away from uh jellyfish as fucking hermit crabs are or Mm -hmm. or squid or whatever you know they might seem like they're filling they are in the same environment but they they're really nothing alike biologically and if that's the case if you can have intelligent vapor well fuck i mean that's that's cuckoo banana berries. I'd love the thought of it. I would love to be able to communicate with something like that. And I'm sure there's something like that in the vastness of the cosmos or the transdimensional fucking hypersphere. But, but I, I, but thinking of it here on earth and maybe they're as exactly unaware of us as we are of them. Like there's some jackasses like you and I talking on some fucking cloud ass podcast or whatever they fucking call it. Vape cast, cloudcast talking talking shit cloud cast <laughs> about like well what if they're solid and what if they move around and they lumber and they're really dense and we can't recognize them because we only recognize really insubstantial shit because that's our senses because <laughs> science and fucking and maybe that's happening i don't fucking know um <laughs> they developed podcast technology along with us <laughs> How weird. Well, you know, I mean, it works on different have, principles. They don't use electricity. They, they use, uh, everything's <laughs> gaseous for them. It's, that's where the argon comes in, friend. Oh, the Aragorn. Yeah. There you go. So there you go. Hopefully so they I don't have, know. I want, uh, the, you know. I want everything to be filled with fucking life. And yeah, I'd like to think cool, we're not destroying you know? it and it's not destroying us. Um, right. There's no real evidence of it. I, I, but yeah, I would like to think there's fucking invisible sky whales that are just, singing their fucking whale song and breeding and doing all sorts of star Trek force shit up in the skies. And, <laughs> just, just and a, that's that a bunch of sky whales fucking is making their way across sky the sky whales and- singing and fucking and making <laughs> earth a better place. There you go. I personally, the, with the theories that we've talked about here, I really enjoy the whole UFO angle, uh, you know, because I'm not necessarily, uh, sold on the idea of the quote unquote nuts and bolts crafts. I'm I'm definitely more into the more fucking Jacques Vallee realm of stuff. Um, so you know maybe these are just things that are kind of passing, you know, just passing through and, and, and making an appearance. There, uh, there's nothing to back that up. Well, it's I'm true sure though. Jacques I mean, he has all the if, information, but I don't. If so. these are interdimensional beings, then they wouldn't need to be here all the time. They wouldn't need no. to be undetected all the time. They could literally just be forming when the environmental circumstances, chemical circumstances, electromagnetic circumstances are just precisely right. They slip in. Maybe they don't even realize they're here and then yep. slip out just as quickly <clears throat> when things change. And if they're not self-aware, they wouldn't know. They're just doing whatever they're doing. And occasionally they get caught on film. That's a possibility. And it um, in some ways makes more sense than them constantly being here. And as our technology increases to perceive the world around us, again, I don't know what kind of tech's being aimed at the atmosphere just to catch, you know, fucking sky krakens, probably not a lot, but, uh, but you think eventually if somebody did catch something like that, that would start a huge trend. So maybe they are just flitting through doing whatever the fuck they feel like. Kind of like the, uh, like that Tic Tac video, just be bopping around, you know, coming out exactly. of the ocean, be bopping around, doing a skilly bop, the old fucking David Lee Roth. I'm so sad and lonely. Boom, 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 boom. They're gone. There you go. That could be. UFOs are marked. 
There it ask, is. Uh, ask, 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 ask Chris now if what he thinks about Sky Beast. I mean, I can call him and be like, blimp or not, and he's going to be like, blimp and hang up. So, <laughs> so there you go. No, no, I'll be Chris. Go ahead. Oh, 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 okay. What do you think about Sky Beast, Chris? I don't. Oh, there it is. That was the best. Re- that's I for the Chris don't. lovers. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. I don't. Now he'd be a get- hell of a lot more funny and engaged, but that that was that was my token tribute to Chris in his absence. He is he is definitely going to bring this, especially if you show him those pictures. Blimps confirmed. You might not want to let him see that link to your article on Mysterious Universe because he would totally be like, "That's a fucking blimp. I told you so." All right, some of them are the blimps. Earth. All right, there one- you go. All right, yep. All right, so let's go. Mexican banker, probably a blimp. Uh, <laughs> Here, don't do it, dude. You're shit, destroy no. the walls Mike from New Zealand, deflated blimp. blimp. Oh, no. Oh, oh yeah, God. dude. Other dude from Italy, phallic it's, blimp. Oh. First dude from Italy, spiky blimp. Oh, fuck. <laughs> dude, I told I fell you. into my own trap. It, oh, oh, no. Oh, God damn it. Uh, intelligent and... zephyrs are fucking infiltrating our Dude. airspace and they oh. will dominate and they will conquer and they will own yes. our souls oh man it is it is the Fear reach the of Chris when he's not even here he just put it into the show <laughs> his he's influence not even with is us. never far never uh, far his influence is just throughout the universe Chris is Miss you, buddy. projection from Venus <laughs> so there you he go. is he's <laughs> actually is. always been on Venus <laughs> It is, yes. He's just been like Dr. He might be the planet here. Venus, as far as <laughs> very, I know. As far as the sentient one day, planet like, Venus, yep. formerly known as Chris, <laughs> currently known as Chris, projecting himself here to fucking spread the whiz. To confirm the blimp. There you have it. Confirm Thank you all so very blimp, much. Spread the whiz. For joining us, the Kryptonaut Podcast, confirming the blimp. Oh, geez. I always forget the ending, but I'm going to remember it with the social medias, Robert. Mm-hmm. The Instas and the Twitters and the Facebooks. Thank you all for checking us out there. Shoot those DMs over. Also, too, don't forget, we have a Facebook fan group, which is managed by an awesome bunch of people over there. You can go to Facebook, look up, look up yes. the podcast fan page. It'll pop up. You can join. There's a bunch of cool stuff happening there. Thank you to everybody over there that administrates and mods that for us. We appreciate that. And participates. The, uh, Thank you all. Yeah, totally. Yep, for participation. We, 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 we think it's awesome. They got their own little cool community doing their own thing. It's super dope. Wicked cool. Totally. Um. The merchandise that is available at the hell or space.com that is powered by T public. Uh, T public offers the holy shirt guarantee. So if anything happens to your t-shirt and I've seen photos of shirts, that have things happen to them. Be sure to contact them and they will replace your t-shirt at no charge. And they will let you keep the one that is messed up. We were just at a birthday party for Christopher and he gave his messed up shirt to his brother-in-law. So, so I was like, there you go. Perfect. You got an extra one. Give it to a family member. Here you go. Sorry. The ink doesn't look right. No big deal. Yeah, it still looked Everyone, all right. Yeah, it still looked fine. Everybody gets a t-shirt. Well, you can, everybody gets a fuck t-shirt. Well, you can do hellerspace.com. Check that out. We got sales happening there all the time. The, uh, Oh, the Patreon, patreon.com slash Kryptonaut Podcast. Thank you to everyone that supports us over there. Jump on, man. There's the one dollar tier, you get one bonus audio. There's the five dollar tier, you get to know more than four, sometimes eight, depending on how we're feeling that month. Um, you know, episode one hundred just went out and that went out to the one dollar and the five dollar tier, which is super cool. So think about of course, this. You literally have a hundred pods you haven't heard if you have never yes. been a patron. Yes. And actually I get messages from people all the time. Like, holy shit. I love your pod. I just signed up for Patreon and oh my God, there's an entire backlog I didn't know about. So, you know, and actually too, how we run the Patreons is the Patreon episodes come out on Sundays between like nine and 10 AM our time, Eastern standard. Uh, so you actually, the beginning of your week on a Sunday, you get the, the Patreon bonus. And then on Monday you get the regular episode and you get to hear us talk about parts of the monday episode on the sunday and it gets all fucked up so, yeah so, yeah it's a little time we whine me in doctor we, who terms we, we try not to do that but no, we, we try do, we try so. to save spoilers and not fuck anything up but sometimes yeah, we totally. make references that will make no fucking sense until the following day because we're idiots and we always record our patreon after the normal after pod the regular pod but yeah. release it earlier you know, it, it, that's geniuses. just how, you know, that is the joys of Patreon. Also, too, Patreon will connect you up with the Discord. It is our own little cool private Discord server. Uh, we have all kinds of events happening over there. We just had the Crypto Bingo, which was super fun. Um, there's a Cards Against Humanity game that, like, they're working on that I got to test play that was super fucking cool. Yeah, and I, I think they just did like, a out. pop-up game on the server, which is super dope. So be sure to check that out. So join the Discord. It's super awesome. Super. I'm actually, I'm in there literally right now. I have a whole side screen set up just for Discord where I'm, like, always in there hanging out. So. So 
be sure to check that out. And uh, yeah, there you have it. I think that is going to do it for this week's episode. Thank you all so very much for joining us. And um, Blimps Ahoy. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm finally there. I can't believe yeah. it took me so long. They I come mean, from the fake moon and they're yeah. here to destroy us. I mean, the moon was never brought into this, but if you want to bring the moon the into moon's this, a blimp, whoa, a whoa, big bring the, round whoa, fucking whoa, sky blimp. Whoa, dude. You're a tide affecting. The- no, I don't believe any of that shit. <laughs> These aren't fucking blimps. They're goddamn, they're either organisms or fucking flying UFOs. That's fair. Flying Fair, saucers, we, I was about to say, but they're clearly not fucking saucers. I was about to fall. Like, I'm a 1950s kid with my fucking space helmet going, everything's a flying saucer. Yeah, <laughs> fucking nice. In my old man voice, which I guess I'd use yeah, if I was a 1950s kid. Fu- See, I can't even get my daughter. references straight. <laughs> oh, I am a sh- daughter, oh, would you, oh, would you look oh, at them boy. flying saucers oh, up there? God, oh, now I'm Irish for no good reason. Yeah, I was going to say, what the <laughs> Well, I'm an elderly Daddy. Irishman living in America in the 50s, and I'm 10 years old, and I have a oh, ray gun man. and a oh, spaceman's helmet. <laughs> and I know, Patty. I know the Patty blimps McDougal. are coming. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. Well, there oh, you have it. What a fucking shit show. Oh, Jesus Christ. Thank y'all so very much, and we're talking to you soon. Bye.